and to tell people that I'm a Christian and I'm in love with Jesus, but I hate the charlatan, pretty much explains that you really have no relationship with God. Hello and welcome to Family Land. My name is Rick Becker. In the early 90s, uh, when my eyes were opened to a lot of the deception that I embraced, such as Dominion theology, Word of Faith theology, the prosperity gospel, uh, and at that time as well, the Toronto blessing was uh, sweeping the globe. So I was, I'd seen a lot of bizarre practices and, and manifestations uh, that you commonly see today in the hyper-charismatic churches and the New Apostolic Reformation. But one of the first things that I did when, when I, I realized that I'd been deceived was to warn uh, people about this deception. And typically, I always heard a similar sort of responses and, and logical fallacies in defense of these false teachers. And uh, I actually wrote an article about this in 2018. And uh, what I'm going to work through today is based on that article. Now, uh, I'm definitely not a prophet, but I guarantee you that you're going to be familiar with many of these responses. So let's begin with the first one, and that is such a, it's probably one of the main arguments. And uh, if you critiquing a false teacher or pointing out the, the errors of Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan, Bill Johnson, Daniel Kalinda, people say, be very careful, don't touch the Lord's anointed. So that's number one. People will, will, will rebuke you and reprimand you and say, be very careful because if you touching God's anointed, you're gonna get into a lot of trouble with God. I've seen many a man fall apart for touching preachers. Never touch them. Never. Be careful what you say. It'll come back at you. My brother, my sister, be careful if you raise your voice against the man of God. Even if that man of God is wicked, sickness will come on you. Never forget what I just said here. Touch not the anointed. So that was uh, Benny Hinn. And uh, where do people get this teaching from? Well, let's go to the Old Testament. We read in 1 Chronicles 16, 21 to 22, the following. He permitted no man to oppress them, and he reproved kings for their sake, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. And uh, the anointed ones, uh, in this sense, was referring to uh, the kings. God anointed kings uh, when he chose them. Um, let me read from 1 Samuel 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took the flask of, flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you uh, a ruler over his inheritance? So basically the story unfolds uh, when um, David had the opportunity to kill Saul. Saul was in a cave and uh, what David did instead of killing him was cut off a piece from of Saul's robe. And David in, fa in fact felt guilty about uh, cutting off the edge of Saul's robe. So let me read from 1 Samuel 24. Uh, this is verse 5, I believe. David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. That's verse 4, verse 5. And it came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. Um, now, moving along to 1 Samuel 24, verse 17 to 19, we read Saul's words to David. And he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have dwelt well with me, while I have dealt wickedly with you. You have declared today that you have done good to me, that the Lord delivered to me into your hand, yet you did not kill me. So um, it's clear that, that touching the Lord's anointed in context would have meant that David actually murdered Saul, but he didn't. And uh, he, in fact, there was another opportunity, a further opportunity to kill Saul. We'll read about that account in 1 Samuel 26, verse 8 to 11. Um, and uh, in fact, let me read uh, from verse, yeah, let me just actually read the, the, the passage. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now therefore, please let me strike him with the spear to the ground with one stroke, and I will not strike him a second time. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, 
For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? Uh, and then verse 11, the Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord anointed. But now please take the spear that is at, at his head and the jug of water and let us go. So it's clear from the context that the meaning is don't kill the individual. Now, I really don't want to kill false teachers. Uh, I hate their doctrines. I hate the damage that their doctrines uh, uh, inflict on people, but I don't want to kill them. So that's really a, a, a nonsensical argument to use. And in fact, it's just proof that people who are following these false teachers actually don't know what the scriptures teach. Um, who are the anointed ones today? The answer is that every Christian has been anointed. Let me read from uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 to 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. And then the next verse, uh, 1 John 2, 18 to 20. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Once again, we see that all believers are anointed. And in fact, what that anointing does is help us identify men like Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and all the other false teachers out there. So it's, it's very clear that uh, this is just uh, intimidation, manipulation, a way to threaten people, to instill fear in you, that you do not do what the Bible commands us to do, uh, which is to mark and avoid those who bring a different doctrine. So that's the first one. The second one, I'm sure you've heard many, many times, and that is, do you know them personally? Well, it's not necessary for me to meet Bill Johnson, for me to meet Kenneth Copeland or Joel Osteen or Joyce Meyer or Christine Kane or the Beviers when their teachings are out in the, the public domain. I read their books, I watch their sermons, and I'm able to compare what they teach to the scriptures. So it's really not necessary to meet them. Um, have they taken the time to get to know personally the people who have, who have been damaged by their uh, aberrant teachings? I don't think so, you know. Um, and daily, I'm sure you, you, you're aware that... Uh, their sponsored posts sometimes will pop up on your Facebook feed. And uh, so they are uh, propagating their teachings with impunity. And yet we expected to take the time to, to meet them and get to know them personally, which, which is really difficult to do, uh, as you'll, you'll know if you've tried to reach out to one of them. Um, let me give you a prime example of why this excuse definitely doesn't fly. And I'm sure you're aware of uh, the scandal uh, involving Mark Bickle, yet another uh, celebrity teacher who, who got caught. Um, he groomed uh, and sexually abused a minor. I think there were other victims as well. I'm not sure. Uh, and he used uh, false prophetic words uh, in the grooming process. Now, I mean, it really should not be surprising, considering that he revered the Kansas City prophets. Uh, one of them being Bob Jones, who got some young ladies to undress and stand before him naked so that they could receive the word of the Lord. Uh, the other one was Paul Cain, who struggled with homosexuality and alcoholism. I mean, really, really bad fruits. You know, but because they were prophets, all these things were overlooked and excused, and uh, the damage was done and inflicted. And um, for decades, people, let's... Uh, let's use the term they use sometimes, heresy hunters or, or pesky basement bloggers who are just uh, jealous and full of religious spirits who write and warn about these people. They've been ignored for years. And the, war, the writing was always on the wall with Mark Bickle. False teachings, false prophetic words, yet he was given a platform. So uh, let's have a look at uh, Dr. Sam Storm's response uh, to the whole Mark Bickle scandal. You know, it's been devastating. Um, nobody likes to be lied to and deceived, especially by close friends. And uh, when people, um, I've been getting uh, 
uh, called out on the internet and every other way. Um, people saying, well, what do you think now? Storms, the guy that you praised from the platform and endorsed uh, has done all these things. And I say, you're right. I was deceived. I hope and pray you never have to go through what I've endured because it's not fun. It's not pleasant. <clears throat> so I don't know how I couldn't see this in Mike because I do consider him a very close friend. But then I have to say, well, thousands of other people are in the same yeah. boat. None of us saw it. Yeah. None of us. We who were in small group gatherings with him for years, <clears throat> shared our lives together, prayed together, ministered together, traveled the world together. Not one of us ever detected anything that would have led us to believe that he's capable of what has now become public knowledge. So I guess misery loves company yeah. in that way. Uh, Cause I, I beat up on myself. I say, Sam, do you not have discernment? Do you not, you have no sense of judgment? And I think, well, nobody else does either because nobody else saw it well that's not true a lot of people saw it they didn't know what mike bicker was up to but they saw that he was a false teacher and refused to give him a platform and instructed people and warned people you need to mark and avoid international house of prayer and mike bicker but of course those calls went unheeded for the reasons i, I listed before these are just people with a religious spirit. These are critical people. These are people jealous of the move of God, et cetera, et cetera. It's amazing because in Sam Storms' own circle, there are people who have schools of the spirit, or I don't know what they actually call it. But in those schools, they teach on discernment and words of knowledge and prophetic words. And right under their nose, one of the leaders they revered uh, committed these uh, atrocious uh, sins. So... The bottom line is that Bickle was given a platform by people who teach on discernment, by people who who uh, uh, defend the modern-day prophetic and the authority of modern-day apostles and prophets. It really is tragic. And uh, the whole platform that Bickle had could have easily been avoided uh, if people just marked and avoided him. So that was the second one. Uh, do you know them personally? The third one, also very, very common, is this. Have you approached them directly? So where do people come up with uh, this argument? Most of them will cite Matthew 18, verse 15 to 18, to justify uh, the fact that we need to go to these people and confront them personally before we make known in public that their teachings are false. Um, and let's read from uh, Matthew 18. This is verse 15 to 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So the context should be very clear. The issue here is between two brothers in a local assembly or church or fellowship who've got an issue. The one has sinned against the other one. Uh, keep in mind that false teachers are not your brother. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. And uh, their message is in public and their sin is against the whole body of Christ and deceiving people in the church. So... This passage is instructive clearly regarding church discipline. It's not a instruction on how to deal with wolves in sheep's, sheep's clothing or false teachers. And uh, incidentally, this passage is also used uh, by people, proponents of the false spiritual warfare view. Uh, you know, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. They use it to bind uh, spiritual forces in high places and demons and the devil. It's got nothing to do with, with that. It's got to, the context is church discipline and the decision made on earth uh, dealing with the brother who has sinned and who refuses to repent. So um, attempting to reach false teachers via social media or a telephone call or email is, is really, really difficult. Um, most of these guys have a team that surrounds them that protects them from you know pesky people who are asking really difficult questions. But just to give you an idea of what happens if you do reach, try and reach out to them, uh, this is what this was this was my experience. 
Um, I tried to reach out to Messenger International, which is the ministry of John and Lisa Bevere. And let's have a look at some uh, screenshots. And this is what transpired. So this is uh, their page. You go into the website. This is the uh, page you land on. You can see a giving donation thing. And then on your left, you will see there's an opportunity to have a live chat uh, with uh, one of their staff. So that's what I did. And I proceeded to ask the question. So from reading from left to right, uh, my comments in the black. Hi, I would like to know if John Bevere supports the ministry of Benny Hinn. I know he was mentored by Benny Hinn and served as a pastor under Benny Hinn, but I've never heard him warn about Hinn's ministry. Does that mean Benny Hinn is a teacher we can trust and support? And then one of the staff members replied, Hello, Rick. John and Lisa Bevere generally do not make public statements about other ministries and organizations. We believe in the unity of the body of Christ and the discernment of the Holy Spirit. Please follow God's leading through the word and the spirit when deciding who to listen to. And then I replied, but unity is surely never at the expense of sound doctrine. If Benny Hinn teaches aberrant doctrines like word of faith or the prosperity gospel and pretends to slay people in the spirit by waving his jacket, does John not have the responsibility to warn the body of Christ? See Titus 1 verse 9 and Romans 16 verse 17. And then she replied, if you have a check in your spirit regarding following Benny Hinn, please feel free to use your discernment. No public statement has been made regarding his or other ministries. Now, before I go to my reply, I've uh, put a little arrow there in red. That is very telling. No public statement has been made regarding his or other ministries. And I'm, I'm going to tell you why just now. But let's go on to my reply. Okay, so discernment is, according to your reply, is based on a check in my spirit. Does that mean I must not compare what someone teaches with the word of God but rely on the check in my spirit, which could just be a subjective feeling. Did the Bereans go by check in the spirit or compare Paul's teachings to scripture? I'm struggling to understand why someone like Costi Hinn, Benny's nephew, who worked under Benny, had the boldness to expose Benny's false gospel and thereby save many from the clutches of deception. But John Revere remained silent. And then her reply, not at all. As stated before, please follow God's leading through the word and the spirit of God, very different than your spirit, when deciding who to listen to. If you have further questions, connect with your local pastors and leaders. For more, for more from John on authority, responsibility, and hearing from God, please check out the resources available through Messenger X. Well, I'm definitely not going to um, check out what John Bevere teaches on hearing from God, because I know for a fact he can't hear from God. If he did, he would have repented of his uh, false teachings, manipulating, controlling uh, the people. And uh, you can have a look at my episode on the Bevere's where I thoroughly expose their false teachings. So I mentioned, uh, you know, let's, I mentioned that I'll get back to the reason why John Bevere doesn't mark and avoid or make public statements about other ministries. And this is why. This is a, a really good website, NAR Connections. It's it's quite telling, you know, birds of feather flock together and wolves hunt in packs. So let's have a look. Uh, this is why John Bevere doesn't make public statements about other ministries, because he mixes with uh, false teachers himself. So here's an example. Here you can see John Bevere with another man who was exposed, Robert Morris, and then on the right with another man who was also exposed, Brian Houston. So here he is mixing with false teachers and predators. So obviously, he's not going to call him out. Call them out, and uh, you don't want to call out uh, the people who actually give you some of your bread and butter. I mean, you've got to remember that uh, men like Bevere and uh, all these celebrity teachers get paid a handsome sum of money when they appear as a guest speaker. And here you have uh, Eric Johnson, Bill Johnson's son. This is from 2017. We will have Mike Bickle, John Bevere, and my dad in the same room for three days. I feel this will be a unique time in having three distinct representations of the body of Christ. Well, none of them represent the body of Christ in any way. Uh, Bethel Music also be doing the worship, etc. And that was at the Open Heavens Conference. That, by the way, Open Heavens is another buzzword, NAR buzzword. 
uh, that you'll find they use quite often. And the next one, number four. Well, why don't you just pray for them? Well, uh, can you find an example where Jesus prayed for the Pharisees? Um, let me go through some verses so that you can find out what Scripture actually tells us our attitude should be towards false teachers. 2 Corinthians 11, 12 to 15, and Paul writes, But what I am doing I will continue to do so, so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be found just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. So Paul here is describing them as uh, uh, Satan's ministers. Jude 1, verse 3 to 4, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write about you, write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write you, exhorting that you contend, contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 1, verse 10 to 11. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of dishonest gain. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 to 5. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and teaching. For the time when, will come when they will not endure sound teaching. But wanting to have the ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away the ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. So um, I pray for the people who are caught up in deception. I pray for wounded sheep uh, who's, who's almost suffered a shipwreck of their faith due to the teachings of wolves in sheep's clothing. So there is definitely um, compassion for those who are caught up in deception. I know many of you watching this have been caught up in the NAR or uh, hyper-charismatic church or some sort of dominion theology church or, or church that teaches the prosperity gospel. And so we know that even as Christians, we can be deceived and temporarily caught up in deception. So yes, it's definitely our duty to pray and warn those who are caught up in deception. But I don't see any instruction to uh, pray for wolves, pray for those uh, who are who have hardened their hearts, who have seared consciences, and who 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 teach for shameful gain. Now I know sometimes it's hard to to draw that line and the distinction between uh, when when is someone a blatant wolf or just an ignorant pastor who needs to be corrected in their doctrine. But, you know, when we're speaking about uh, these celebrity people who have, who've been in the ministry for decades, who've been warned, who refuse to listen to any valid critique, and who are clearly uh, abusing, controlling, coming up with new revelations, new doctrines, and using that platform, as we've seen in the case of Bickle and so many others, to abuse people and actually commit crimes for which they should be in jail, like Robert Morris. These are blatant wolves. And uh, let me just read quite a, a frightening verse. This is what Paul writes in Galatians. But if we, or even an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be a curse. Those are some really, really uh, stern and firm words from the Apostle Paul. So that was number four. Number five, this is quite a common one as well. Why do you have to mention their names? And let's hear once again from Benny Hinn. Attacking man of God by name. Somebody's attacking me because of something I'm teaching. 
Let me tell you something, brother. You watch it. You're God in heaven. I wish I can just... Oof. They call out the medicine in my foot. You know, I've looked for one verse in the Bible. I just can't seem to find it. One verse that said, if you don't like them, kill them. I really wish I could find it. <laughs> but don't mention people's names on your radio program and your TV program, thinking you're doing God's service. You're not. You stink, frankly. That's the way I think about it. Sometimes I wish God would give me a Holy Ghost machine gun. I'll blow your head. Unbelievable. This is why we mention names. 1 Timothy 1, 19 to 20. Holding faith and a good conscience by rejecting the sum of made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are, oh, look, he's going to name somebody, Hymenius and Alexander, whom I, have, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. 2 Timothy 1, verse 15. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. 2 Timothy 2, verse 16 to 18. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenius and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying the resurrection has already happened, they are upsetting the faith of some. 2 Timothy 4 verse 10, For Damar, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. 2 Timothy 4 verse 14 to 15, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds, Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. Um, so, I mean, in Romans 16, verse 17 up to 18, we are instructed to mark and avoid or to watch out for those who bring a gospel contrary to what is taught in Scripture and what the apostles preached. So how do you mark and avoid or how do you watch out for someone when you don't mention them? How do you, how do you warn if you're an elder or pastor or teacher in the church how do you warn your flock about a false teacher in your town or city or village if you don't name them? So it really is biblical to mark and avoid to name those who bring teachings like uh, Benny Hinn's false teaching, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Bill Johnson, Chris Vallotton, the Beviers. We have to mark and avoid them, and that includes naming them. That was number five. So number six, their ministry has fruits. And I've heard this so many times. You point out that... Uh, point out a false teacher or a church in town that's not actually a church but a business or being run like a company and uh, you'll often hear their their followers say but you know there are good fruits coming out of this ministry or, or from this teacher so that's really a, a one of also a, a, another common argument um, but when you break down what those fruits are you'll find out that it's not a legitimate argument so let's have a look the fruits that they are referring to are not valid arguments they are just logical fallacies so the first thing that they they mean by fruits is that they're referring to well you know our church or this ministry or this person is involved in a lot of good works and, and social justice works and charity works um uh, let me give an example um iris ministries that's Hari, Hari baker's ministry uh, they have orphanages. They have uh, built orphanages and they run a lot of orphanages in Africa. Um, Christine Kane, for example, she founded uh, an organization that uh, combats human trafficking and they do a lot to uh, rescue young and vulnerable women uh, out of this uh, despicable trade. <clears throat> so these are commendable social justice works. But keep in mind that many cults and false religions are engaged in the very same works and in many charities. So if you're using that argument, then uh, Islam has good fruits and cults have good fruits. So that's not a valid argument at all. The second one, uh, fruit that, that actually that they're mentioning, uh, or that they don't realize, but they 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 referring to Wow, it's such a large church, or these people have a huge following. How can so many people be wrong? Well, quite easily. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, we are living in a time uh, when people will not endure sound teaching, and they will accumulate teachers for themselves to suit their own passion. So once again, it's the same argument. If a large following is a good fruit, then there's many false religions who are bearing good fruit. Um, the third one, which they'll be referring to, are signs and wonders. Well, you know, this is, you know, 
the good fruit is that God is moving in their midst and things are happening. People are getting healed and slain in the spirit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And dig a little deeper and you find that these are false signs and wonders. Just look at Bethel, for example. The glory, the glory cloud, the infamous glory cloud, is not a good fruit. It's uh, glitter coming from the events. Um, then they will say, yeah, but you know, God is moving and you guys are just anti-miracles and, and anti uh, the gifts. Well, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, and here they are pointing to the fruits of signs and wonders, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So clearly that's another uh, false argument in defense of false teachers. And then the final one, by good fruits, they mean what we saw with Mark Bickle. Oh, but he's just such a nice man. I know him personally and, you know, he doesn't speak bad about anyone and he's so hospitable and just a down-to-earth guy. They see that as a good fruit. Now, while we can judge, uh, you know, it's sometimes very difficult to judge by outward appearance. Uh, we find out with all these scandals that things are not always as they seem with Robert Morris and Brian Houston and, and Bickle. So that's the danger of judging by outward appearance. And uh, one thing I must point out is that um, these people who are judging by their person's uh, teacher's personality or that they're such a likable person are missing a very, very important thing. And that is the qualifications to be a teacher or elder or pastor. And those qualifications include their life and their doctrine. So while they can cover on the outward and on the surface their lives, they can have uh, amazing prophecies and teachings that captivate their followers, but they're abusing somebody on the side. Um, and in fact, like Robert Morris, you know, committing a crime on the side. Um, so they can cover up the outward. What they can't cover up is the second qualification, and that is that they must be able to rightly divide the word of truth. They must be able to exposit the scriptures. They must be able to teach the Bible in context. And without fail, all of these men caught up in these scandals failed. They twisted the scriptures and they mangled and butchered the word of God inserted uh, their own meaning into the text. So that was that is always missed by these people. When they point to, oh, such a lovely guy, warm, likable, that's fine, but they can disguise it. The question is, what do they teach? What is their doctrine? And then moving along to number seven, their teachings have helped me. So I hear this uh, quite often, and it's quite understandable because most error, uh, has got an element of truth in it. In other words, false teachers don't just always teach blatant error and heresy. They do at times teach some uh, good teachings. They, they, uh, they have teachings that might encourage you. They have teachings that might uh, touch on uh, important uh, doctrines that, that edify and encourage at times. But that is exactly how deception works. False teachers use the name of Jesus, as we saw in Matthew 7. They do things in the name of the Lord. So they speak Christianese, they go through the right motions, and that is how they deceive people. So that is how deception works. There's always a mixture of truth and error. And the problem is, it's, it's, I don't know if you ever watch these <clears throat> forensic programs or, or crime series where somebody is trying to poison their spouse. And you'll find inevitably that... Uh, uh, it's a poison that they put in in a scrumptious meal or in something that looks good. And then over time, the poison starts kicking in. And the victim begins with in, initially minor problems with their health uh, to the point where they're incapacitated and, and lying in, in intensive care in hospital and about to die. And it's the exact same thing with false teachings, is that initially... They're not really going to have an effect on your life. Remember, fruit takes a long time to appear on a plant, on a tree. Not just good fruit, bad fruit as well. It takes some time. So initially, the young, the small apple will look good and, and, and like the other apples on the tree. But then right near the end, 
you'll see that it's actually rotten to the core. And that's what false teachings do. They initially don't have the full effect. But later on, when you hit a crisis in your life, you'll find out that your theology or the, the false teaching that you embraced does not work. It's exactly what we see in Bethel. All this, we're going to make Bethel, a, we, we, we're going to make Reading a, a cancer-free zone and we pull down healing for cancer from heaven, et cetera, et cetera. In reality, look at uh, this tragic end of Benny Johnson. It does not work. So eventually, it's going to catch up with you. And let's move on to point number eight. Who are you to judge? And it's ironic that those who accuse you of judging a false teacher, in turn, are actually judging you. Um, I mean, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, if the Apostle Paul was around today, they would have accused him of being judgmental and, and being a heresy hunter. People who, who are using this argument uh, don't judge. Uh, we'll quote Matthew 7, but they'll totally ignore the context. Let me just read Matthew 7, verse 1 to 5. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take out the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So the warning here is, is actually about hypocritical judgment. If you're a hypocrite and you're judging others, Jesus actually gives us a test, a way to judge. Matthew 7, verse 15 to 20. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. The good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you will know them by their fruits. That's a way to judge, or test, or discern. So this verse has got uh, the beginning of, of chap Matthew chapter 7, do not judge, has got nothing to do with exposing false doctrines or comparing what a teacher teaches to the word of God or naming someone who teaches a doctrine contrary to what we see in the Bible. Absolutely nothing. So, once again, an argument that holds no water. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 12, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Are you not to judge those who are within the church? Very, very clear. But let's look at two false teachers who implore their followers not to judge. What to do then if you think someone's false? There's this temptation that we get all this, oh my gosh, this person's false, they're deceiving so many people. I need to warn the people. This is not your job. My sheep know my voice. There are some servants of God out there that are like, maybe kind of like Pharisee, right? They themselves maybe are, are prideful. They themselves like to condemn and judge. Like those who are sinning, they like to be like, you're so wrong and coming in that way. Well, the people that follow them are the same way. My sheep know my voice. Uh, his voice is, is in scripture. And uh, if you read the scripture, you'll hear clearly that uh, Jesus said we need to mark and avoid a false apostle or prophet or whatever office she's claimed this week uh, as a false teacher. And uh, actually, it is the job of an elder or a pastor and of us as normal people in the church to warn about false teachers. I already mentioned Titus 1 verse 9. Uh, that uh, it's the task of every elder to uh, exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. Romans 16 verse 17, mark and avoid those who bring obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have been taught. And uh, let's, let's uh, move on to the next clip. God's children that actually want to be in his will, who have a pure heart, they will hear his voice they will see, I see pride, I see condemnation here, I see judgment, I don't, I don't, I don't see God there much, and definitely not as much as here, I'm going to go here, where I see God, where I see compassion, where I see mercy, where I see real love of God, I want to go there. We are, see, she's conflating hypocritical judgment with sound judgment or discernment. Uh, what she's really saying is, is go where your ears get tickled, and chase after these self-appointed apostles and prophets who are 
uh, who have an importation for you or will uh, deliver you from your sin when actually you just need to die to self and crucify the flesh. So uh, she's just encouraging people to go with a message, all oh, lovey, dovey, nice. It's not going to offend uh, offend you. It's going to appease your, your carnal nature and, and the passions of your flesh. Um, so uh, let me just remind you uh, what uh, Paul wrote to, F to the Ephesians, uh, warning them about people like Crick. Ephesians 5, verse 6 to 11. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of a light, for the fruit of that light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, and do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. And here's some more from Catherine Crick. We don't need to worry. We just save people. Let people follow who they want to follow. Let people be judgmental together if that's what they want. We can't force people. <laughs> uh, no, definitely not. Did Paul have the sort of same blasé attitude towards the uh, false apostles who were playing in the Corinthians? I don't think so. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12 to 15. Uh, we've looked at this verse before, but let me read it again. And what I'm doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. And let me just read from Jude, verse 17 to 23. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. So this is definitely not a passive response. We have to be active and snatch people from the fire. We should care who they follow, um, without a doubt. And let's move on to yet another clip from Catherine Crick. If you really think in your heart someone's false, someone's wrong, what you should be doing, being the brightest light, the best representative of God you can be. If you really have a heart for the lost, if you really have a heart for people who you think are deceived, the more you shine bright, and I'm speaking now like to servants of God, to people who have platforms. Many times people with platforms feel like I need to rescue people, I need to blast this person so I can rescue those people that are deceived or whatever. Instead, why don't you shine brighter? Instead, why don't you be the greatest example of God's love that you can be, the greatest vessel of God that you can be, which is love. Why don't you focus on that? Why don't you focus on doing the work of God? Why don't you fo focus on helping people, actually helping people, rather than being distracted and, and throwing stones at someone else? That's not helping people. God's entrusted you to a platform. Again, this is, is, this is nonsense. Paul was probably the supreme example of love uh, to the Corinthians. In fact, you know, he didn't want them to stumble, so he didn't even take an offering that was due to him. Uh, that was his right. He didn't want to be a stumbling block, and he didn't want to be like the false apostles in Corinth. Um, and he warned them, because he loved the Corinthians, he warned them about false, the false apostles, as we've just read. Um, you just think of this way. When a when a wolf comes into a field uh, to attack the sheep, what does the shepherd do? Uh, invite the wolf to come and lie down next to the sheep and have a wonderful outing and uh, make friends with the sheep? Does the shepherd think that the wolf can suddenly change its nature and become like a sheep? Of course not. The shepherd's job is to protect the sheep and chase away the wolf. Um, that's the duty of a shepherd. This just gets more ridiculous uh, as she continues. So let's listen. When you can focus on being the brightest light you can be, the most like Jesus, the most full of his love, having his fruits the most, 
Now you're allowing God to lift you more. You're allowing God to be, okay, I want to send your videos out more. Oh, now you're being like me so much, I can trust you with more. I can put more anointing on you more where people are going to be so touched by the power of God and I'm going to lift you now. Why don't you put yourself in position for God to lift you rather than put yourself in a position where he has to push you down and humble you? Uh, tickling ears might uh, increase my subscribers, but it's definitely not going to increase my anointing. Uh, <laughs> Um, as we've seen, all believers are anointed. You know, pe people are quick, have no idea what the anointing is. To them, it's a commodity. To them, it's a uh, it's a means to elevate themselves and claim that they walk in the sep this uh, special powers that, you know, if you ordinary Christians want, want to experience, you'd have to follow her unquestionably and sow a seed into a ministry. It's a lot of absolute rubbish. Um, but let's move along to the second false teacher. Todd, what? And people hate Oral Roberts, people hate Kenneth Hagin because they have no Holy Spirit, no relationship with Jesus. So they hate these people. So you see what he's done there? Made the assumption, the false assumption, that we hate uh, men who bring a different doctrine. That's not true. We don't hate them. We hate their doctrine. And as I've said, we pray for those who, are, who have been deceived by them. Um, now, Todd, you know, Todd himself does something really unloving, and, and he condemns those who have issues with false teachers by implying that they are not saved. And the next clip from Todd White. And to tell people that I'm a Christian and I'm in love with Jesus, but I hate the charlatan, pretty much explains that you really have no relationship with God. Yeah, false again. To tell people that I'm a Christian and expose false teachers and wolves in sheep's clothing pretty much explains that I take the word of God seriously and that I fear God and his word. Um, you know, doctrine is supposed to divide because error and truth cannot mix. So, you know, when unbelievers come to me and they say, um, hey, look, what's, look, look what's happening in the church, you know, all these scandals and, and uh, I hear about, uh, hear about Brian Houston and... Uh, Mark Bickle, and uh, aren't you embarrassed, you know? And I say, I'm not at all embarrassed because these people are not part of the true church. And I explain to them the difference between the visible church and the body of Christ. And I explain to them that these people do not represent my God. They do not speak on behalf of Jesus Christ. Uh, they represent themselves. And, and in fact, the Bible would call them a minister of Satan. So immediately... I've distanced myself from wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm not going to let people like that tarnish the name of Christ and bring the gospel into disrepute. And let's have a look at another clip from Todd White. When you're filled with Jesus, you get persecuted by people that are anti-Christ. Anti-Christ is an anti-Jesus Christ. Anti-Christ is anti-anointing. Christ means the anointing. So anti-Christ is anti-anointing. There are people that say they believe in Jesus that are totally against the anointing that are anti-Christ in nature. Going back to 1 John 2, verse 18 to 21, uh, it's the anointing that helps us recognize wolves in sheep's clothing like Todd White. Uh, you know, these guys view, you know, when somebody points out, and there's been a lot of videos, uh, I know Stephen Kozar from the Rest Up Church broke down in, in detail how Todd White pretends to, to lengthen a leg. You can watch that on the American Gospel. But uh, so a valid critique like that, Todd White would take as persecution. It's absolutely uh, ridiculous. So um, let me read these uh, pertinent words from uh, J.C. Ryle. He that is not zealous against error is not likely to be zealous for truth. That's such a good quote, and it, it really paints a picture of these uh, false teachers, they are uh, not zealous against error because they're not zealous about the truth. They preach false doctrines. They're not interested in true doctrines. They're interested in followers, in building up a name for themselves in their own little private uh, empire and kingdom on earth. And as the scriptures point out, most of them are, are driven by greed. That's one of their primary motives, greed. And uh, they puffed up, arrogant, boasting about their visions, and, and they're full of pride and they need to be mocked and avoided. And number nine, you are sowing division in the body of Christ. So this is another accusation. They'll accuse you of, uh, of sowing division on the body of Christ and, and you know, not uh, keeping the unity of the faith, but uh, 
there are people definitely who cause divisions in the church. And let's find out who they are. Romans 16, 17 to 18. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So those are the people who are causing the, the division in the church. Um, and it's a good division. It's a necessary division because doctrine and truth must divide. It must separate the body of Christ from people who masquerade as uh, servants of Christ. These are false prophets and apostles and, and revivalists and evangelists. And let me just read from uh, 1 Timothy 6. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So I think you've seen, uh, you've seen Todd White, you've seen Benny Hinn, you've seen Catherine Crick slander people who are purely interested in truth, who want sound doctrine, and who are prepared to expose false teachers. True unity is never at the expense of sound doctrine. Ephesians 4, 13 to 14, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So unity of the faith, of the, the body of teaching, of sound doctrine, means that we are not carried about by all these new teachings, uh, all these apostles and prophets in the NR who come up with five ways to hear God's voice or uh, different kinds of prophetic personalities you have. These are winds of doctrine that deceive people and who are immature people. And so they're caught up by the cunning and the deceitfulness of these uh, false teachers. And number 10, they will ask you, well, what have you done for the Lord? Because there's the, the, the idol, the false teacher with a big ministry and charitable works and supposedly signs and wonders and healings and, and salvations, um, you know, uh, you'll often hear Daniel Kalender brag about, boast about all the salvations that CFAN have had, which really is just a, a little tick on a card. It doesn't necessarily mean a true salvation. But, you know, in, in contrast, you know, you a simple Christian at home and, and uh, just living your life simply and uh, maybe spreading or preaching the gospel or sharing truth when the Lord gives you the opportunity, you know, you can't compare yourselves to these people. They must surely be right. So what have you done? What impact have you had on the world? And um, the answer there is, is really simple. Uh, this is really a, a diversion tactic. And uh, the question has nothing to do with examining the false doctrines of their favorite teacher. So they're asking you, based on the assumption, as we saw, that their false teacher or their favorite uh, heretical church has good fruits. So you need to go back to that and, and point out that the fruits that they think are fruits are not, in fact, good fruits, but bad fruits. You can also point out, uh, point out an apostle who actually, this apostle has had a huge impact. And he's obviously the apostle Paul. So let's see what uh, the apostle Paul boasted about. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 30. If I must boast, I'll boast of the things that show my weaknesses. What a contrast between a great apostle and the false apostles and prophets today who are just plain narcissists. Um, and that is one of the characteristics of false teachers. They're arrogant. They are boastful. And uh, like Pharisees, as I said, like to display their works in public. And they make sure that their followers get the impression that uh, God is moving mightily through them and through their ministry. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. 
that promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption for whatever overcomes a person to that he is enslaved. And then number 11, uh, I've had this a few times. So you think your theology is perfect. Everybody's wrong, but your theology is perfect. And the answer to that is, is no, I don't think my theology is perfect. I definitely think that all of us, even the solid teachers that we follow, to some degree, we are all going to be uh, corrected in heaven. Um, but the difference being is that apart from keeping to the main essentials of the faith, and uh, I hope I can explain this properly here, but often people talk about, you know, as long as you hold to the essentials of the faith, you're in my team and it's all right, you know. But uh, the problem, of course, is that most of these heretical ministers and false teachers will have a generic statement of faith. They'll affirm the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They'll believe that God is one. Well, you know, so does the devil. Uh, and, and they will hold to all the major tenets and the orthodox teachings of, of Christianity. And so that's sort of the front that they put up. The issue is not just do they hold to the essentials of the faith. The issue is just what else do they add or what else do they teach? And uh, you see, there are many non is what would be classified as non-essentials of the faith that lead people into deception which is just as bad as denying the essentials of the faith for example let me give you some examples um uh the teaching on on uh, hearing the voice of god has led countless people into a rabbit hole of uh, starting to believe and listen to their own thoughts or even doctrines of demons so there's a non-essential teaching that can lead people into mysticism. Uh, one of the other teachings, um, for example, let's let's look at, at word of faith theology, which teaches that you your words are causative. You can decree and declare things. I'm sure you've seen some of these wacky NAR prophets uh, speaking to the weather and the storms and claiming that their words can 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 shift hurricanes and tornadoes and uh, that unless they partner with God, God can't fulfill his purposes and plans on earth. He's sort of, you know, bound by these people. Unless they decree and declare, he can't do what he wants to do on earth. So basically, you know what that is? It's called little God theology. So these people have in fact made themselves into little gods. Now tell me that's not as damning as denying the essentials of the faith. Then, of course, I could go on. We can talk about the uh, demon slayers and their deliverance ministry. Well, didn't they drive out demons in the Bible, in the gospel? Yes, they did. But once you are born again, you've been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of light. You're a new creation. Christ became a curse for you. A believer cannot have a demon. But here they are teaching that believers are Believers can have demons and all kinds of weird spirits like a sneaky squid spirit. And this leads people into deception. It leads them into greater bondage. So he has a non-essential, supposedly, teaching that can actually lead people into greater deception and demonic bondage, if you want to call it that. Then, of course, there's all the inner healing techniques. These are not necessarily or are not seen as... Uh, essentials of the faith this is a non-essential non of the faith but you go and do a sozo at the Bethel and, and I've spoken to people who have been through this they will tell you that, that this is this is as a dangerous a teaching and practice as any other cultist would, would take their members through it involves uh, past re regressive memories um, and the te technique they use is almost like hypnosis and it can lead people into such bondage uh, that it traumatizes them for many years and brings up false memories, which results in false accusations against, against family members. Sozo is a very, very dangerous inner healing course. It's not biblical. And you need to run away from any Bethel Sozo course as fast as you can. So these are just examples of what many people would say are non-essentials but they are non-essentials that are just as damning as rejecting any essential of the faith. And then the final one, number 12, you'll hear this often. Well, you know, you know, I stick around. I don't really believe that it's all that bad because I just eat the meat and spit out the bones. Well, in there are no bones 
in sound teaching, and that's not a verse, and that's not a biblical doctrine. In fact, uh, whenever we see uh, an instruction in Scripture to test things or to mark and avoid, the end result means that we must flee from such things, expose them and avoid them, not stick around and, and, and try and eat the meat and spit out the bones. Um, the Scriptures have the milk of the Word and the meat of the Word, uh, you know, teaching for those who are or young or spiritual milk, but then the solid meat of the word, which uh, which uh, is sometimes I, I I would admit difficult to understand, but there are no bones in scripture. Um, anyone who says to me, uh, you know, I just eat the meat and spit out the bones, I would just reply with uh, the words of Paul to Galatians in uh, Galatians five, verses seven to nine. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. And that is exactly what a little bit of false teaching does. It leavens the whole lump. It's the rotten apple and it'll spoil the whole barrel of apples. So, the you know, there's no such thing as eating the meat and spitting out the bones. So that concludes this episode. Um, I think uh, a lot of you will have identified, as I said, initially with a lot of the arguments here, but uh, if this is something new to you, I hope and pray it's been helpful and given you uh, some uh, information and, and tools on how to combat these uh, logical fallacies in defense of false teachers. Thank you for watching and until next time, bye-bye.